despite being from a country that uh, has four million people and about 60 million sheep up until a year ago, I knew pretty much nothing about agriculture. Uh, my work is uh, pretty much uh, is just in Africa, and this is what uh, I'm going to talk to you about. Could Africa be the world's next breadbasket? So this is the question that was going through my head when I, as I traveled through the continent for this assignment for National Geographic magazine. The continent has about 60% of the world's remaining arable land, yet uh, imports something like $20 billion worth of $20 billion worth of food annually. And the yields on the continent are about a quarter of that of the US. Yet there are, uh, there's plenty of fertile soil and a lot of available water. So it's quite a concern that despite this potential, Africa still remains the, uh, the world's most hungry continent. A lot of people believe that large-scale farming in, in, uh, with foreign investment is the solution to um, Africa's food challenges. Foreign investment in, this, in the banana plantations like this in Mozambique. Uh, a lot of people believe that these kind of farms are, are, hold the potential for um, feeding Africa and potentially the world. This foreign-owned plant, uh, banana plantation uh, has turned Mozambique from an uh, importer of fruit to an exporter. And it also provides thousands of jobs. It is, in fact, the third biggest employer in the country. Not only that, but these, this foreign investment has bought electricity and uh, roads to the area surrounding the farms. So this could potentially be a, a future for the continent. But not everyone believes that large-scale foreign investment is the way forward. This is uh, Simdabi palm oil plantations in Liberia. Simdabi is a Malaysian-owned multinational with uh, interests all over, uh, all over the world. Palm oil is particularly interesting because it's in about half of all the supermarket foods that we consume. But it also causes large-scale environmental damage. Landlocked Ethiopia has uh, greater potential than, than most other countries in Africa. There's plenty of available land and plenty of water. Uh, and this potential, although having said that, it's had a very sad history when it comes to, um, to the issue of food security. But its potential has attracted farmers like this um, Iranian farmer. The locals like Iris particularly appreciate the farms coming to her country. She, her mother became ill. She had to take on a, on a job to support her family. Despite only earning about $1.30 a day, it's a well-needed uh, um, money for her and, and for her community. So this farm is a, is a, is a success story. Um, but I have to say that in other parts of Ethiopia where I went, uh, it was the exception rather than the rule. I traveled to Gambella in Western Ethiopia, near the border with Sudan, and found that nine out of the 10 foreign farms that I visited were failing. Poor infrastructure, bad management, conflict with local people, and expensive running costs all contributed. What's worse, though, is that many local people were displaced, and the forests that they relied on for their food had been destroyed. This girl is in a, um, in a farm owned by a large Indian group called Karaturi. And she's picking weeds from between the, the maize stalks, which she'll use for cooking. This used to be a forest where they used to hunt together. I followed her back to her village and was, uh, as soon as I arrived, people started telling me stories about um, food shortages and malnutrition. So a lot of NGOs talk about uh, foreign investment, in, in, as we heard before, as, as land grabs. And I think that there's definitely concerns over big foreign companies coming to poor countries, food insecure countries, growing food there, and then taking that back to their own rich countries. But there's also a lot of concerns about 
what happens to the smallholders when deals are done between governments and investors? Uh, as I discovered, this is a, a very sensitive topic. My uh, career m mostly focuses on human rights issues, and so I'm used to going to countries where the government isn't that keen on having me there. Um, the Ethiopian government were very happy for us to come to their country to talk about commercial farming, but we got extremely upset when we wanted to find out what the uh, impacts were on local people. Another challenge doing this story was that the information that we were getting from NGOs and the media and governments and companies involved in this issue often didn't match what we were seeing on the ground. Seems to be a, some kind of PR war, the, uh, um, which, made it out, which made it for us very, well made it for me very difficult. I was trying having to explain to my editors here in Washington DC why they weren't gonna be getting the pictures that we thought we were gonna get. Often we found that these land grabs were on paper only and that stories put out by governments and by NGOs um, and the companies involved were, seemed to be conveniently suiting, uh, suiting their agenda of talking about how successful or how, how, much, how big the failures were. It seems that in these remote parts of the continent, there's very few independent voices. But not all foreign investment in Africa in food is a land grab. And not all food produced in Africa by foreigners taken out, by foreigners is taken out of the country. Um, investment comes in all shapes and sizes. And what I found is most of the food being produced by foreigners was actually for local markets. I mentioned earlier that uh, Africa imports a lot of food, so there's, there's actually really high demand for uh, locally produced food as well. Thousands of Chinese uh, have come to Zambia for the, into the mining and construction industry, and other Chinese have followed to produce food. Now, these aren't uh, you know, state-sponsored. These aren't from big companies. All of these are from lower middle-class families in China who've come to Africa to seek a better future. In the capital, Lusaka, the Chinese have pretty much taken over the um, poultry business, um, which is great for uh, the locals because they get cheaper chickens. But then there are examples of Africans doing it for themselves. And a really interesting example of this is in Somaliland. 50% of Somaliland's GDP is made up of exports of sheep and goats. This is a, a, a market in the capital Hargeisa, capital of Somaliland. They sell about, uh, about 3.5 million animals come through this market every year. Most of those animals are, are going to the Middle East. About 1.3 million sheep and goats are exported in the period leading up to the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. I spent a few days here on the, on the coast here in, in, a, in, a, in a port town called Berbera. These large ships in the six weeks leading up to the pilgrimage uh, up to three or four of these um, ships come a day, and they can fit about 85,000 sheep and goats. It smells pretty bad. <laughs> but the reality of agriculture in Africa uh, looks more like this scene from Tigray in northern Ethiopia. Um, about 80% of agriculture on the continent is smallholder farmers. And for a lot of them, the, their, their farming practices haven't changed for hundreds of years. Tigray was at the epicenter of the, um, the famine in, in the 80s. Um, and uh, these farmers suffered tremendously. And, and even today, uh, up to 3 million Ethiopians still rely on food aid to survive. But cheap fertilizers and some government assistance is helping to uh, improve food security for a lot of these people. This is Mulugeta Tesfai and Nagetsi Miresa. They farm wheat, barley, and beans in the mountain of Tigray. They don't produce enough food to feed their family of nine. And uh, Mulugeta on the right has to take on a day laboring job occasionally to supplement their income. But he says that life has vastly improved from in the 80s when he says there was hardly any food around at all. 
as beautiful as uh, the, the geography and the people are of Tigray, um, they're hardly a positive advertisement for smallholder farming. So should we forget about smallholder farming when it comes to talking about the, um, feeding Africa and feeding the world? I think not. Um, Non-governmental organizations like the One Acre Fund who are working in Rwanda and other parts of East Africa are, are proving that smaller holders can make a real contribution. With some basic training and some small loans which allow these farmers to get um, access to some fertilizers, these guys are able to um, quite often double their yield in the first year of the program. This is 36-year-old Mary Mukarukaka, and this is a, a quote I'm going to read to you from Mary. Before joining One Acre, I farmed only for food for my family, and it would only last a few days. I then joined the program. From my first harvest, I was able to purchase two packs of cement. The second season, I was able to buy a goat, and now I have nine of them, and I plan to buy clothes for my children this next season. So Mary is growing enough food for herself and for her family, but she's also producing a surplus to be able to buy clothes and cement and, and animals. So it's only, it's, it's only a small thing, right? But for these people, she's, you know, she's able to feed herself, she's able to feed her family, and I think that in a small way she's able to feed the world. The answer to Africa's food challenges are complex. I mean, here we can see a commercial farm next to smallholders. And perhaps this is a, a model for the future, not just commercial farming, not just smallholders, but a, a combination of the two. But Africa is an incredibly diverse continent, and what is right for Mozambique may not be right for Rwanda or for Ethiopia or for Somalia. There are enormous challenges, but there are plenty of examples of agriculture working on the continent. There are many examples of, that illustrate the potential of Africans themselves. Africa is a diverse continent of nearly a billion people. Half of them rely on agriculture for their livelihoods. It's in their interest and ours that the resources and expertise be made available to make them more productive. <laughs> and perhaps these farmers can make their continent the world's next breadbasket. Thank you.